Thanks, Kelly. <clears throat> okay. You know, something happened the other day that made Shannon kind of angry. All right, so she's not here today, so I'll share it, right? <laughs> and really, it pointed out a pretty big flaw of mine, too, which is where I want to camp today. This is on my flaw, not Shannon getting angry, right? All right, so we have to go back a few years in order to get the entirety of the story. So a while back, we owned a Honda Accord, okay? And we didn't buy this Honda Accord until it had over 200,000 miles on it. So we got it, and it was a pretty old car. But it's probably still the favorite car that we've ever owned for Shannon. She just absolutely loved this vehicle. And we had it for years, and it caused us absolutely no trouble. You know, it kind of looked a little strange because it was like 20 years old. But it was an amazing car. We, we really loved it. Well, it got to the point where it just wasn't working quite right, like there were some things going wrong with it. And so I took it to my mechanic, and I said, hey, you know, this is what's wrong with it, it, it I think, and it needs to be fixed. And he's like, yeah, okay, we'll get it fixed. And then I, I come back in to pick up the car, right? So I'm thinking, you know, this is over, pay the price, take the car, go home, and we're good for another few months. And then he says, I got something that you need to listen to. I was like, okay. So we go into the shop, and he turns on the Honda, and it's got this ticking noise, tick, 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 tick. And I was like, yeah, I know that. It's been doing that for a while. He's like, this is a bad noise. He says, this is a, a lifter noise. And so he's like, your lifters are going bad, and it's really expensive to fix. And so you, you need to get a new car. And then, of course, the very next thing out of his mouth is, oh, yeah, we sell used cars. Why don't you come out to the lot, and I can show you some of those new cars. And so I asked him, I said, OK, OK, all right, the lifters are going bad. Is this like a like five months down the road thing? Is this like a two weeks down the road thing? Or is this like, you know, I'm going home today, and I'm going to get stranded? And he says, well, it's probably closer to that last one. Like, you're going to get stranded here pretty soon. And I don't know any better. I don't know. I can't lift a, listen to a lifter noise and be like, oh, yeah, that's got two weeks in it. I can hear it. I, I don't know that, right? So I have to trust this guy that's standing in front of me telling me this. So I call up Shannon, and I say, hey, the Honda's bad. I don't want you to get stranded on the side of the road. So why don't you drive down here, and we'll just take a look at some of these cars in the lot. And so we did. And there were two cars that were interesting to us. One was another Honda Accord that was much newer, and another one was this Chevy Cruze. And so this guy, he's like, first of all, you've got to get rid of your old car. That's a no-brainer. Second of all, you've got to buy one of our cars. Of course, that's also a no-brainer. And then he said, uh, between these two, you should probably get the Cruze, right? The Honda Accord had the same amount of miles as the Cruze. The Honda Accord was twice as expensive, probably because it was a better car. But I didn't, he was trying to tell me, no, the Cruze is a great car. It's Chevy's answer to the Honda Accord. It's GM's answer. It's going to last just as long. It's going to have just as little problems. You're just going to love this thing. So let me get you into this, uh, this Chevy Cruze today, which, of course, you know, we, we have a Chevy Cruze. That's what we ended up buying, right? So we traded in our Honda Cruze that day for that other car. Now, this is what Shannon needs to learn. Sometimes you need to be really clear with me. <laughs> you know, I don't know if this is the best idea. That's not clear enough. Say, hey, Aaron, let's go home and think about this. That's clear. She's like, oh, whatever you want to do. And so we ended up buying this car. If I would have stopped for just one day and I would have gone home for just one night, I would have seen like glaring holes in these guys' arguments, right? And I probably would have been able to get us a much better car at a much better price. You know, I also bought a warranty for that car, a three-year warranty. I had a two years left on the factory warranty, yet I still bought a three-year warranty. That doesn't make any sense, Aaron. And if I would have gone home and just for one night sat there and thought about this, I would have thought, this is a dumb idea. And I would have done something different. But in the spur of the moment, I'm like, OK, this guy's telling me this. I need to get it done now. Let's get it done and move on with life. And so like, if you ever hear Shannon yell at me about the cruise, and it's because of this. Like, she's like, why did you buy me this car? It's a good thing I bought that warranty because the transmission ended up going out at 75,000 miles, and uh, we had to replace that. Thankfully, the, the warranty took care of that. But you can tell it's a great car, right? So, so we're not even to the part that makes Shannon mad yet. OK, so that, that's just backstory. So here's a story where she actually gets mad. So we have a problem with the cruise. And so I take it to the same mechanic. And I'm not able to go pick it up because I'm busy. And so I'm like, Shannon, you need to you know, go down there and, and pick up the car. And so she does. And so she walks into the place. And the guy looks at her, and he says, 
This Chevy Cruze is an awful car. Whoever told you to buy this? You should have never bought one of these. They're pieces of junk. <laughs> and Shannon, I don't think she said anything to her credit, but she's probably she's thinking the entire time, you sold me this car. <laughs> you told me it was going to be a good car. And now you're telling me it's awful. It didn't make her a happy camper, that's for sure. <clears throat> I don't know if it happens to you, but it happens to me, where somebody tells you something and you believe it. And instead of stopping for a moment and thinking critically about it, you just kind of move through it, you accept it as gospel truth, and end up, you end up making decisions that you shouldn't have made. And you end up going in directions that you shouldn't have gone in. Whereas if we had taken just a little bit of time, sat down, thought about it critically, you know, ran it through the mill, right? And, you know, researched it a little bit against some real facts, we would have found out, okay, this is probably not the way that we should go. You know, in the city of Corinth, there were false teachers, and they were preaching a different version of Christ. They were preaching a different gospel message, a gospel message of works and following the law of Moses rather than following after um, the sacrifice of Christ. And they were buying it. They were just eating it up wholesale. Thousands and thousands um, you know, of things that they were teaching that were wrong, but it didn't matter. They were buying into every single one of them, and they kept looking at Paul skeptically and saying, well, maybe what Paul told us is wrong. What these guys are telling us is right. And they were going down a wrong pathway, whereas if they just would have stopped for a moment and did some discerning, perhaps they wouldn't have got in as much trouble as they ended up getting into. And this is child's play. You know, I hate to say that to Paul, but what Paul was dealing with in the early church is child's play compared to what we deal with today. And the reason why is because we live in an information age. There are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of false teachings that you can access before you leave the chair that you are in. You don't have to go anywhere. And there are beings thrown at us all the time. There's so much information that comes our way. And we can't just get into a mode of where we just accept what somebody says because they said it, or we accept what somebody says because we want to hear it. We need to be critical. You know, it's not that we don't want to hear things. We do. But when we hear things, we want to discern. We want to make sure that we run it through the mill. We think about it a little bit. You know, we run it through Scripture. Is this what Scripture really says? Whether that's a view that you've held since you were two years old going to Sunday school or whether it's something that Pastor Bob told you last Sunday. It doesn't matter what it is. We need to run it through the mill of Scripture, and we need to practice and learn the art of discernment. That's where the Corinthians were falling into a whole bunch of trouble is because they weren't able to discern what these false teachers were saying was false. They thought that it was true. They thought that Paul was the liar and that these people were the ones that had it all together and it was getting them into all sorts of trouble. So Paul is asking us, you and I as Christians, he's asking the Corinthian church to have some discernment. Now, I think the Bible teaches that discernment is actually a spiritual gift. So what's a spiritual gift? When you become a Christian, God supernaturally gives you gifts that you are supposed to use to build up the body of Christ. Okay, we talked about this a couple weeks ago with generosity. I think that generosity is a spiritual gift. But just because something is a spiritual gift doesn't get me off the hook for it if I don't have that gift. I can't just say, well, generosity is a spiritual gift, so I'll let the generosity people give. No, I still need to be a giving person. might not be my spiritual gift, but I should still give. And it's the same thing with discernment. I do think there are people that are supernaturally gifted by the Spirit with this, this ability to discern good from evil, right from wrong, what is biblical from what is false. But that doesn't get the rest of us off the hook and say, well, I don't need to have any discernment because somebody else will do it for me. We need to learn some good skills of how to discern what is true from what is false. I mean, even something as simple as fact-checking something before we go all in on it would go a long way. Don't buy everything you hear. Now, I hate to use this phrase, do your research, because it's been so co-opted anymore. Do your research means go find some crazy person on YouTube that agrees with what you already believe. That's not doing your research. You know, doing your research is going back to original sources, original material. So you know, every once in a while, somebody will post on Facebook a quote, right? And then it'll have a, a person's name in it as, as if that person said that quote. And so just for kicks, just sometime, just whenever you see one of those, just look it up and see if that's accurate. I have looked up like 10 or 12 of those over the past few years, and guess how many of them have been accurate quotes attributed to the right person? Zero. 
Not a single one of them. Yet a lot of times in the comments, oh, I can't believe this person said this. What an awful human, blah, blah, blah. They didn't say it. <laughs> just, just go back to an original source. Find it where they said that in an interview or said that in, on TV or wherever. You can't find it because it, it just doesn't exist. And I think it's, we often think people are going to act in good faith. And a lot of times people aren't acting in good faith. And we need to realize that. And that means that we need to do a little bit of critical thinking. We need to do a little bit of even the simple part of fact checking because we need to discern truth from error. Because I think as Christians, we should care about the truth. We need to determine sin from righteousness because I think as Christians, we should care about righteousness. You know, we need to discern solid biblical teaching from scripture twisting because I think as Christians, we should care about what the Bible actually says. You know, I heard somebody put it this way. We need to do the math. Um, sorry, I'm an accountant, so math is cool. All right, so let's, let's do the math. It says, don't add to the word of God. Okay, so if it adds to the word of God, then we have a problem. So somebody has got this huge new prophecy. Let me tell you about this. All these new things that God are going to do. You automatically should start scratching your head thinking, okay, wait a second. Don't, does it subtract from the work of Christ? So does it take away from what Jesus did for us on the cross and through his resurrection? Does it multiply the requirements for salvation? Yeah, you got to repent of your sins and believe in Jesus, but you also got to fill in the blank. And does it wrongly divide the body of Christ? Does it divide the body of Christ over something that shouldn't be an issue? If it does these things, we should stop for a second and we should say, okay, is this something that I should be putting my faith in? Is this something I should be believing? For me too, I mean, I think on a bigger level, like a more macro level than that, does it get the problem of the world right? And does it get the solution to the world's problems right? So what's the problem with the world? The problem is, is that we live in a sin-cursed world because Adam and Eve sinned and brought that sin and death into the world with us. And so we struggle with that. And so the whole movement of history is to defeat sin and death. You know, Jesus started that process by dying on the cross for sin, to defeat sin. He rose again three days later to defeat death. When we put our faith in Jesus, we too can be forgiven of sin and we can look forward to one day being resurrected and defeating death. That's the movement of history. The problem is sin. The, the way of the solution is the work of Christ. If this new system of thought or whatever has a different problem with the world than that, we got to have an issue with it. If it has a different solution to the world's problems, we got to have an issue with it, right? We need to stop and think critically about the things that we hear. And I've learned over my life that lots of people don't really like that. They don't really like to stop and think critically. You know, the, the motto of the church I grew up in was uh, the Bible, the whole Bible, nothing but the Bible. It's like, you know, the, parroting that phrase, the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And so I remember, you know, studying the Bible and then I, and somebody would say something and I'd say, well, this passage says something different than that. Well, don't, don't worry about that. You know, we just need to worry about, you know, what the church teaches. No, wait a second. You told me the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible, not the, what the church's statement of faith says. I'm sorry. You told me the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. So if we're going to interpret the Bible, let's do it. If we're not, then we're just going to play at this, then okay. You know, I even had a professor once who said, we should stop teaching pastors how to interpret the Bible because we spend so much time, here's what he said, we spend so much time learning how to study the Bible, we don't spend as much time and practical stuff, you know, stuff that actually where the rubber meets the road. That was kind of his framing of it. We, we just need to teach people a little bit of theology, and, and, and then all the rest of it just needs to be practical stuff. Oh, man, is that dangerous? You know, why we have an anchor, you know, we have a mooring, and that is the word of God. And everything that we hear, everything that we believe should be filtered through the word of God because we should care about truth. We should care about righteousness. We should care about the Bible correctly interpreted. And I think that's a key phrase there, correctly interpreted, because there's going to be a lot of people that twist scripture. Even Satan twisted scripture. We'll talk more about that um, here in a second. So I believe that we should discern. And I think that's what Paul's asking of the Corinthians. Don't just believe these people because they're coming in and saying things you like or that you want to hear. Test what they have to say. Does it agree with what is real? Does it agree with what scripture has to say? And Paul says, if you, if you do that, you're going to find out that they're, they are false teachers and they are teaching to you a false gospel. So here's the central truth. You know, God wants believers to discern what is true from what is false. Simple as that. God wants us to be in the discernment business. 
And so we need to refuse to follow after the temptation to follow a different Christ. Okay, and I think that's kind of what these, um, you know, in practice, that's exactly what was going on here in Corinth. Look at verse 1. I wish that you would be patient with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are being patient with me. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, because I promised you in marriage to one husband to present you as pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that just as a serpent deceived Eve by his treachery, your minds may be led astray from the sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So they're moving away from Christ and being devoted to something else. Verse 4, For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus, different from the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit other than the one that you received, or a different gospel other than the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. For I consider myself, I do not consider myself at all inferior to these super apostles. And even if I am unskilled in speaking, yet I am certainly not so in knowledge. Indeed, we have made this plain to you in everything and in every way. So he's worried that they're following after a different Christ. Okay, so this, this animal up here, you can barely see it here behind there. But it's, a, it's actually called a Porsche spider. And what's interesting about the Porsche spider is it's got some superpowers that enable it to be a super predator. And it eats other spiders. So its first superpower is its camouflage. It can look just like a dried up old leaf. You can't tell that it's actually a spider. The second superpower that the Porsche spider has is it knows its prey. Like it knows the particular spider that it's after by looking at its web. And it knows what kind of prey that that spider typically goes after and it knows how to mimic it. So like if it's a spider that goes after a house fly, it knows how to tap the web in such a way where the spider feels like they just caught a fly. And so they'll come out from their hiding place and they will be looking for this fly, you know, this meal to eat. And then they'll see this old dried up leaf and they'll go to remove the dried up leaf from their web and boom, you know, they thought they were gonna have a meal, they end up becoming the meal themselves. And so it's, very, it's a very deceptive spider. It's able to camouflage itself. It's able to pretend to be something that it is not in order to lure people in and snatch them up. And Paul says the same thing here about Satan. Satan is able to lure people in. He's able to tempt people with he knows what, they, what, he, what he knows that they want to hear. And he's able to get them to do things they wouldn't otherwise do, you know, through temptation. He doesn't flap at us like a bat coming at us in this big red suit with a pitchfork and try to poke us with it. That's not how Satan is going to come to you. He's going to come to you as an angel of light. That's what Paul says here verbatim, that you know, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, which simply means he's not going to come at us you know, with uh, somebody with their head spinning around and their body rigid and speaking Latin. and He's not going to come at us in those typical ways that we think of. He's going to come at us in, in subtle ways, in ways that seem very logical but are still extremely false. And we need to be ready for the deception. We need to be ready for the scripture twisting. You know, think about Eve, right? So we go all back to the first appearance of Satan. You know, God had told Eve that you cannot eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Told Adam and Eve that. One boundary. All right, now that might have initially created some skepticism. You know, well, why would God tell us that? What's God trying to hide? And that's exactly what Satan kind of pounces on. Well, let me tell you what he's trying to hide. God knows that if you eat from that tree, that you're going to know things that he doesn't want you to know. Is that true? Yeah, it kind of is, right? They were going to learn some things when they ate the fruit that they didn't know before. It is not going to be something that's good for them, but they are, there was some truth in it. But then he twists it. He twists it into God's not good. You know, God's trying to keep you down. God doesn't want you to be like him. And so it kind of fit into what they were already maybe naturally thinking and it led them down a bad pathway to make a bad choice. But it sounds so logical, right? Oh, God doesn't want you to eat from that because he knows better. He knows if, if you eat from it, you'll be like him. He doesn't want you to be like him. And so it takes something that's kind of true, right? And then he kind of twists it to make us uh, want to do things that are against the will of God. That's how Satan's going to come at us. Satan's going to come at us in very logical sounding ways, but things that we should not be following after. You know, he does the same thing with Jesus. I mean, he comes to Jesus in Mark chapter 4 or Luke chapter 4 or Matthew chapter 4. And he comes at him in um, very logical ways. You know, he takes him up to the top of the temple and he says, you know, just throw yourself down from here. And doesn't scripture say that his angels will catch you? 
So go ahead, throw yourself off, you'll get caught. He's actually using scripture to argue with Jesus and twisting it in a way um, that was wrong. That's how Satan is going to come at us. That's how temptation of our own sin nature is going to come at us. It's not going to come at us flopping around and, and it's clearly evil. You know, we're probably not going to be tempted to follow after a, a false teaching that calls itself the church of Satan. It, we're probably not. It's going to come at us in a much more subtle form, just like the Porsche spider just waiting there, perfectly camouflaged um, to grab at us at the exact right moment. So the bottom line here is I don't think that the Corinthian church was being very discerning. And uh, Paul is trying to tell them, you need to be more discerning. So I'm going to compare three churches here. Okay, so church number one is the Thessalonian church. Okay, so how do they fit into this? Well, in Acts chapter 16, we meet a few churches. Paul's on a second missionary journey, and he's making his way through Macedonia. And he comes to the Thessalonian church, which is right after Philippi. And he begins to preach the gospel in the synagogue. That was kind of his strategy. He'd go into the synagogues, and he'd begin to tell Jewish people, like, hey, your Messiah has come. It's Jesus. And so he would try to convert people and start his church that way. So he goes into the synagogue in Thessalonica, and they don't want to have anything to do with him. They don't want to hear a word he says. It's almost like they put their hands over their ears and just start screaming, la, 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 right? And they kick Paul out. He's not there but 14 days, and they have run him out of town on a rail. They don't want to have, hear anything that Paul has to say. So, I mean, if you think about this, I mean, the Jewish people were waiting for a Messiah. And here comes Paul saying, well, let me tell you about that Messiah. They won't even hear him. They won't even listen to it. They don't want anything to do with it. They just kick him out. All right, so we got this on one extreme. And on the other extreme, I think we have the Corinthian church. And here, you know, Paul comes in with his message and they're like, I like this message. Sounds good. Let's, let's believe that. But then the false teachers come in a, a few months later and they say, no, it's actually this. Oh, I like that. That sounds good too. And so you see the two extremes? You've got one, the Thessalonican church, who will not hear anything new. You got the Corinthian church who loves to hear new things, but they just buy it wholesale no matter what. I mean, Paul even has to tell the Thessalonian church. So this, these are actually the people that believe in Jesus, right? He has to tell them in 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, don't quench the spirit. Don't quench the spirit. What does that mean? Well, what they were doing is they weren't allowing anybody to get up front and speak because they could be speaking error. And so Paul says, no, you, you still got to let people speak. Don't quench, don't quench the spirit. Let people get up and speak in the spirit, but then test what they have to say. And once you've tested what they have to say, then accept the good and reject the evil. That's what he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So even the church had to be told, hey, you guys got to open your mind a little bit because there's truth that you're missing out on because you won't give anything a fair hearing. So you got the one hand, the, the Thessalonians were so closed-minded that they wouldn't listen to anything new. And on the other hand, you have the Corinthians that it didn't matter what it was. If it was new, it must be good and it must be true. And so they were accepting things. So who's in the middle? What church becomes a good role model for us as we seek to discern? And I think that's the Berean church. Okay, so right after Paul leaves from Thessalonica, he goes to the Berean church. And they welcome him into the synagogue. And they let him speak. And they listen to what he has to say. But at the end, they don't go, yay, that's great, I'm all in. We're told that the Bereans would gather together afterwards and that they would search the scriptures daily. They would examine the scriptures daily to see if what Paul said made sense of what the Bible was teaching. They become, you know, kind of an example. You know, Luke says, it's kind of rude, but Luke says that the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians. That's his exact words. They're more noble because they would actually give a fair hearing. And they're more critical than the Corinthians, which means that they were more likely to get at the truth because they weren't just accepting whatever they heard without running it through the filter of Scripture. And so I think the Bereans become a perfect model for us that we need to listen, but at the same time, we need to test. We need to discern. We need to make sure that what is being taught and said agrees with Scripture correctly interpreted. We need to think critically. So they were falling for a different Christ. They were also falling for a different gospel. Look at verse 7 again. You are looking at outward appearances. If anyone is confident that he belongs to Christ, he should reflect on this again, just as he himself belongs to Christ, so do we. For if I boast somewhat more about our authority that the Lord has given us for building you up and not for tearing you down, I will not be ashamed of doing so. 
I do not want to seem as though I am trying to testify, uh, terrify you with my letters, because some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but his physical presence is much weaker. Man, I'm in the wrong chapter. I was like, this does not make sense. (laughs) All right, verse 7 of chapter 11. Or did I commit a sin by humbling myself so that you could be exalted because I proclaimed the gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so that I could serve you. When I was with you and was in need, I was not a burden to anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia fully supplied my needs. I kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and will continue to do so. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be stopped in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do love you. And what I am doing, I will continue to do, so that I may eliminate any opportunity for those who want a chance to be regarded as our equals in the things that we boast about. So they're following after a different gospel message. And we know about this gospel message from several other parts in 1 Corinthians. This was also a false teaching that had gripped a lot of other churches, like the Church of Galatia as well. And so it was a law-oriented type of way of looking at it. Okay, yeah, you got to do this Jesus thing, and Jesus is the Messiah. But what's even more important is that you continue to follow Moses. You need to continue to keep the law. Only then can you be saved. So that's what these super apostles with their letters of recommendation, that's what they were teaching, and they were getting people to buy into it. Because think about it, half the church grew up Jewish. Half the church grew up, and that's what they did on synagogues. They would talk about the law and how they were supposed to live out the law. That doesn't just flip off the moment that you say, oh, there's a new covenant, and and Jesus has fulfilled it, and we don't need to worry about the law as much anymore. Now we've got the law of Christ. There's no light switch that flips like that. And so, yeah, when these people come and say, well, Jesus is good, yeah, you're you're right, you should be following Jesus, but you still need to follow the law in order to be saved. It was kind of a tempting message to have, but it was a different gospel than Paul's gospel. It was a different way of looking at the human heart than the way that Paul uh, says that we should look at the human heart. So these false teachers were teaching a different gospel, and these people were buying it. And one of the things that they were uh, focusing on Paul about was the fact that he wouldn't accept money from them. Okay, so you wouldn't accept money. Now, why would that be a bad thing, right? I mean, it's saving some money, right? Getting some, getting some free work. Why would they care about that? Well, if you think about it, are you a little bit suspicious of things that are free? Like if you're just going down the side of the road or you know, you're walking through the middle of the mall or something and somebody comes up to you and says, here, have a free necklace or whatever it might be. What, what is going on in your mind? Okay, you're thinking in your head, this ain't free. There's something wrong here, right? Nobody just gives away free stuff. And so you're suspicious of it. Maybe it literally is free. We tried to do that once as a church. We bought a whole bunch of diapers and tried to give them away in Busco to to families that needed diapers. And my goodness, you think we had a a third eyeball. I mean, people are like, really? And even the people in need that you could tell really could use the diapers that stopped and would take them from us, even they were like, this is free? Are you sure this is free? Like, yeah, just take it. Just take it. And it's like just so much suspicion because it's free. And I think it's probably the same thing with uh, uh, these, these people. Are like, well, if Paul had something worthwhile, then he would charge for it. He would accept support for it. It must not be worthwhile. But Paul was not wanting to be a burden to the church. You know, he doesn't want to take advantage of them. He was taking support already from established churches. He was also working with his hands, you know, making tents. The problem was, and this is where really the rubber meets the road, is that the Corinthian church was so image-focused, they didn't want a guy leading them that was working with his own hands. You know, I mean, making a tent is bloody work, right? I mean, you're taking leather and, and killing animals and stretching it out, and it's, it's you know, it's a lot just more disgusting than it sounds like. Oh, I'm making a tent. Okay, you're making it out of animal hide, and guess what? That's going to, you know, entails a lot of bloody stuff. And so I think that the Corinthian church was so image-focused that they wanted somebody that looked the part. You know, they wanted somebody that accepted the money. They wanted to, you know, kind of look like they were an established organization. And the false teachers were giving them that, and Paul was not giving them that. And Paul was not giving them that because he cared about them. So this guy up here on the right, he's, he was the pastor of Hillsong in New York. He, he no longer is. Um, he had an affair with somebody, and, you know, that whole story. But... This, whenever I think about the image obsessed pastor, this is the guy that comes into my mind, like just always on point, right? He's got the perfect, 
clothes. He's got the, you know, the hipster glasses, the perfectly coiffed hair. He's got the pics all over his Instagram, lifting weights and all of his muscles bursting out. Here he's hanging out with Justin Bieber. Um, okay, that's not us, right? We're, we're not an image-obsessed church, but there are a lot of churches that are. And they want their pastor you know, to be hanging out with highfalutin people. And they want them to be rich and driving a fancy car and living in a fancy house because it says something about them, that they're a successful church. And I think that's kind of what was going on in Corinth as well. You know, I had another seminary professor who taught me, you can't grow a church unless you're image-focused. And I'm not saying that's an exact quote, but it's pretty close. And he told a story about how, you know, when he got out of seminary, he went and pastored a church that was just outside of a big city. So it was kind of a small town, but just outside of a big city when he started there. And church was about 50, 60 people. And then he was there for, I think, 20 years and you know, grew it to be five or 600 people. And so he really believes this, I think, that, that one of his keys to success was being diligently focused on image. Like if anybody got up on stage, they had to look a certain way. Uh, even the ushers who would carry around the, the offering plates he said that I made them wear suits and ties. And so that they just looked the part. And he says, that's why we grew. I remember thinking in my head, okay, first of all, do you really know why you grew? I mean, can you really analyze that? Can you trace it back to my, my uh, ushers wore suits? That's why we grew. Did you do an interview with everybody that came and said, hey, why did you come to this church? Well, man, your, your ushers, their, their ties are really cool. I just really like that. I mean, it couldn't be that you were right on the outside of a big city and then the big city swallowed you up during that 20 years. That couldn't be part of it. I mean, there's so many other things that probably went into it besides just, hey, I made people wear suits and we cared about image and so we grew. Um, but there are so many churches like that, you know, huge mega churches where they drive, you know, their pastors drive fancy cars and have fancy homes and they love it because it makes them seem like they're a success. So I'm sorry, you've got a bald pastor who is skinny and blind and he's a hunchback. Sorry. I'm not hanging out with Justin Bieber tomorrow and I'm fine with that. I don't need to hang out with Bieber, the Biebs. All right. <clears throat> so Paul working, making tents and, and accepting money from other churches, this just didn't fit in with their image and that was a slap in the face to him. And they instead were drawn to the false teachers who really did care um, about image. And so they weren't really trying to even test teachings. They were more into style rather than they were into substance. And that seems to be a huge problem at the Corinthian church from start to finish. We should care about the truth. We should care about what is um, uh, the true gospel from what is a false gospel. You know, one day a guy came up to me and he was telling me a story. And I told you guys this is probably about nine, ten years ago. So we'll see if you remember. But he was telling me a story about uh, Mr. Ed like the show. So, you know, for those under the age of, I don't know, let's say 55, <laughs> Mr. Ed was a TV show back in the 60s, a black and white show about talking horse. All right. And so what, what he was telling me is that the show had a problem. And that was is that the horse that they got to play Mr. Ed was a very uncooperative horse. Sometimes they were able to get the horse to do the things that they wanted it to do. But other times they weren't really able to get the horse to do what they wanted it to do. And so it was wasting a lot of money and trying to hire new trainers, um, trying to, uh, with all the lost footage that they had. And so one of them had an idea. There was a nearby little tiny zoo, kind of like Black Pine Animal Park, where they were filming. And they had a very, very well-trained zebra by the name of Amelia. So it was black and white, so they thought, we can get away with it. We will, you know, kind of substitute when Mr. Ed doesn't really... Um, do the things we're telling him to do. We'll bring in the zebra, and we'll have the zebra do the parts. And so for five years, they did this. And so almost every episode over the first five seasons of Mr. Ed, you know, Amelia appears at some point in the episode. All right, so he's telling me this. <clears throat> and they had a problem, though, because when season six came along, you know, the show was still in prime time. And at that point, you know, all of the shows were starting to go color. Okay, that's when color started becoming a big thing. Now, if you were outside of prime time, it was still black and white, but if you're in prime time, they were all becoming color. So they wanted Mr. Ed to become color, but they knew, okay, if we go color, then people are going to know that sometimes Mr. Ed is a zebra named Amelia. We can't have that. So the first thing they did is they moved the show outside of prime time so that they could stay black and white a little bit longer. But then the next year, it got to the point where all shows were going to color, and now they were in a real pickle. All right. 
So I remember hearing this story, and I'm like, this guy believes this. He really believes this. And I was like, I, I've seen black and white stuff. I think I can tell the difference between a black and white zebra and a black and white horse, right? And so I thought, well, I'm going to do a little bit of research on this. And so I went to Snopes. You know, Snopes kind of is a fact checker type of place. And I went to Snopes, and I typed in Mr. Ed Zebra. And boom, an article pops up. I'm like, oh, good. And it goes on and tells the story I just told you. That's how, where I got most of the details. It's from the actual article on Snopes. And its rating for the story is true. So you can, you can probably Google it right now, look it up on Snopes, and type in Mr. Ed Zebra, and the story will pop up, and Snopes says it is true. I was like, this cannot be true. Like, it, it just can't be true. And so I thought, well, I'll just look one more source. And so I just kept looking around and typed in Snopes and uh, Mr. Ed and Zebra, and I found out that the first day that this particular story appeared on Snopes was on April 1st. It was, a, it was an April Fool's joke. <laughs> and this guy, I mean, it kind of went viral. And this, this guy literally believed this. He believed that you know, Mr. Ed was a horse, a zebra named Amelia. And it just wasn't true. Now, if I had just taken the guy's word for it, and then I got up here and I said, did you know that Mr. Ed sometimes was a zebra? You might be like, really? <laughs> right? Even if I had just gone to Snopes and just kind of did a cursory look at it and said, look, it says it's true must be true. And then I gone around and told you all this story and said it's true. And the entire time it's a lie. What does that teach us? We need to be very careful. We need to make sure that when we believe something, especially when we're basing our actions on it, that it coheres to reality. And so we talk a lot about truth and there's a lot of different definitions of truth out there. My definition of truth is does it cohere to reality? And that story does not. I don't care if it's your truth or my truth or whatever truth. It's not true if it does not cohere to reality. And so we just need to make sure that when we hear something that we don't just accept it, neither should we just reject it, but that we should run it through the filter of Scripture, that we should even just do some basic types of fact-checking. And the Corinthians weren't doing this. They weren't doing it. They were just, whatever somebody said, they were believing it. We need to be more like the Bereans who were willing to test things. You know, there was a boy that came in and asked his dad, Dad, is the moon made out of cheese? I heard that the moon is made out of cheese. Maybe you've heard that before. And the dad didn't really want to engage, and so the dad just said, well, just why don't you go read your Bible and find out? So the kid started reading the Bible, and he came back like a few hours later, and he says, I found out. The Bible teaches that the moon is not made out of cheese. And so he's like, oh, where does it teach that? And he says, well, the moon was made on day four, and cows weren't made till day six. So there you go. <laughs> right airtight logic um, <clears throat> but at least the little kid he's trying to do some fact checking right and so we just need to make sure that before we believe something before we put our weight on it before we make decisions based on it before we lambast somebody over it we do our due diligence and that doesn't mean just finding some random person on the internet it means trying to go back to original sources as much as we possibly can trying um, to trust experts and that's one great thing about having a church family is we have experts in different fields right here that you can ask about different things you know if you want to know about welding ask todd you want to know about diesel engines ask dan don't ask me i'm not going to be able to tell you you know if you want to know about uh, ct machines ask john you know if you want to know about pharmacy stuff ask jackie you want to know about law stuff ask heidi you know, there, there's so many different people that we can talk to that we tr trust and we know that they've probably thought through these things for years and years and years and years and years and they probably have a good answer based on the research and the time that they have spent. So we don't want to fall for a different Christ. You know, we don't want to fall for a different gospel. And I think the Corinthians were also falling for a different pathway to righteousness. Look at verse 13. <clears throat> I could try to get the right chapter this time. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it's not surprising that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will correspond to their actions. I'm not thirsty right now. So like, you know, if you went out to the kitchen and you got me a glass of water and you brought it up and you set it here, I wouldn't drink it because I'm not thirsty. 
All right, now let's say that instead of Sunday school this morning, we decided to have a church-wide 5K. All right, I know that's, that's not going to happen. Let's just say for, we, we did that. We could run all the way down to 33 and back. I think that's about 5K, all right? And then we just started church right when we got back, just huffing and puffing, and we get back. And then I get up here behind, and I start to preach. I might be thirsty. So if you brought me a drink from the kitchen, I'd probably be like, just down it, okay, because I'm thirsty, okay? This is the problem, I think, with the modern church, especially in America. We have so much information at our disposal and so much spiritual information at our disposal that we're not thirsty. We're not thirsty. And that's, that becomes a problem. You know, we are so saturated with this information that we aren't really in need of anything. We, at least we don't think we are. And that can cause problems when it comes to learning and growing in our relationship with Jesus. Because we might not be thirsty for the knowledge of God. We might not be thirsty for what God is saying. We may not be thirsty for what God has to offer. We might not be thirsty for the truth. We might think that we can save ourselves with our own righteousness or our own knowledge or with the plethora of information that's around us. We need to be truth seekers. We need to thirst for it. Not just thirst for information. Not just thirst for something that we already agree with, but thirst for true biblical teaching and knowledge that will help us to grow. You know, there's a thing called confirmation bias, and I always worry about it. Every day of my life, I worry about confirmation bias in my own heart. What that means is I'm looking for information that will prove what I already believe, rather than actually looking at something objectively and trying to think, is this true or is this not true? Because it's just natural. That's just who human beings are. That's why, you know, if you grow up in the Middle East, you're probably going to be Muslim. If you grow up here, you're, you're probably going to be Christian. It's because of this confirmation bias. You know, what we're already predisposed to believe, we tend to believe. And so we need to kind of get around that. We need to start thinking about, okay, what is true? What does cohere to reality? And with, as Christians, we have an authoritative guide and an authoritative source to go to, Scripture, so that we can run ideas through it so that we can determine what is truth from what is falsehood what is sin from what is righteousness what is an accurate portrayal of what god has said to what is scripture twisting you know a great deal of the new testament was written to combat false teachers you can't open a book of the new testament a letter of the new testament that doesn't describe somewhere how to deal with a particular false teaching it's all over because it's a problem it was a problem in the early church and it is even bigger problem today just because of the plethora of information that's out there. We need to be careful. We need to make sure that we are working on our discernment skills. I think the Bereans are a good example, willing to give other points of view a hearing, but also critically examining them through the word of God. And the Bereans also had one more step on there that I haven't added yet. Not only did they willing to listen, not only did they examine what they heard through the truth of scripture. But once they found out what was good, they responded to it. They didn't just let it fatten their heads with more knowledge. They lived it out with every moment of their life. I mean, if that's not a perfect example of what discernment should be like, I don't know um, what is. No wonder Luke says that they were nobility. They were more noble than the Thessalonians. So I want to end with a couple passages of scripture. This one comes from Romans 12. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so our minds, our wills, our attitudes, all of this should go through the transformation process. Peter says this in 2 Peter chapter 1. God's divine power has given us everything we need for life and for godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. And if we don't allow God's word to transform us, then we really haven't let it do its work. You know, not only are we supposed to know the word of God, we're supposed to live it out in our daily lives. So as we imitate the the Bereans, we eagerly expect to hear from God. We willingly listen to the truth wherever we find it. We challenge it and test it through scripture. And if we determine that this is indeed what God has said, then we better live by it. Let's pray. 
dear Lord, as we think about discernment and just, you know, how needed it is in our day, Lord, I just pray that you can help us with good skills of discernment, how to find out what is true and what is not true, what is right and what is wrong, what is sin, what is righteousness, what is scripture correctly interpreted versus what is scripture twisted. Lord, and we just pray that we can do that as a family of God, or that this isn't something that just one person does, but that we, we all do together. We discern and we try to find out what is true and to live by it. We pray that in your wonderful name. Amen.